Hello and welcome to this webcast. This is Ed Scotus and uh, you are at the Pillage the Village Redux webcast. Uh, your presenters today will be John Strand and little old me. And I tell you, we are really excited about this webcast. What John and I have been doing is going back and forth over the last several weeks, uh, just talking about some of the, the cool things that we've been doing in pen tests lately and in our research that can really help in post-exploitation. So we, we call the talk Pillage the Village Redux, More Pen Test Adventures in Post-Exploitation. I guess I should introduce uh, John Strand and me. Um, so John Strand is the founder of Black Hills Information Security. It's a security consultancy. He's got an amazing team of individuals there that do penetration tests, incident handling, forensics, all kinds of great stuff. He is also a SANS instructor He's the current lead author of 504, a class very near and dear to my heart, on incident handling and hacker attacks. He is an amazing man. I remember I first met John, it was over 10 years ago, and I saw him presenting some of my own material. He was presenting it to a classroom and to me, and it blew my mind because he presented it so well. I was, I was just amazed. And I took him out for steak and beer that night. A lot and, of beer. Yeah, a lot of, a lot of steak too. And I yeah. said, um, hey, John, um, you ever see that movie uh, Princess Bride? And he said, yeah. <laughs> and I said, well, that's good, Wesley. Uh, have a good night. I'll most likely kill you in the morning. And uh, <laughs> which was a, I viewed as a compliment. Um, well, but there's more to that story. You, you, got me, you got me relatively drunk. And then, then you say, hey, hey, how would you like to take the Guardian's interview right now? And I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Uh, and my background, this is Ed Scotus, I am the curriculum lead uh, for penetration testing at SANS. So if you have some ideas for a SANS pen test uh, course or topic you'd love to see in our courses, let me know. It's my job to make sure that happens. Uh, I'm also a pen tester. I'm the founder, the founder of CounterHack, uh, which is a company that builds uh, simulations, capture the flag events, uh, cyber war simulators. We are the folks that create net wars and run it. We're also the, the team that uh, created and build and operates Cyber City. So anyway, that's, that's our overview and intro. I'm just going to go ahead and turn it over to John, who's going to present for a little bit, and then he's going to yeah. take it back to me. And uh, we're here to share ideas with you. If you have any questions, please do type them in. We'll have a question and answer period at the end, and uh, I'll be watching your questions as you type them in. Oh, I should point out, this session is being recorded, so um, if you have to leave halfway through, please don't. But if you, if you do or you want to share it with your friends, um, there will be a recording link created. So, very cool. Strand. Thank you so much, Ed. Um, I also wanted to say thank you to Mike Poor. Uh, Ed, Ed, if you heard Ed and I bantering before we actually got started, which we weren't on air, thank God. Uh, but Mike Poor is one of our nearest and dearest friends. And uh, kind of a little bit of background, if you want to see a really kind of cool presentation on the original Pillage the Village, uh, there was two, I believe. But uh, Mike Poor is the only one that I could find. From, and they have the slides up there, the core pillage, the village slides. And for me personally, whenever we're looking at what pen testing is, uh, I had two big brothers, Ed Scotus and Mike Poor, that really, really kind of set in stone what network penetration testing meant. It did not mean finding an exploit. It did not mean trying to hack into computer systems. It did not mean trying to get domain admin. It meant trying to truly understand the organization that you're breaking into. It requires having a high level of curiosity about everything about that organization. And, and, you, and I'll talk about this later. The love is so important, and curiosity is key for that. And, and all the way through those slides uh, that Mike and Ed put together from the original Pillars of the Village is that idea of understanding the technology that you're actually working with. And that is the goal of the Pillage the Village series. Even though we're separating them out by five years, it still matters. So I want to start off with some basic core fundamentals. Um, Ed and I were bouncing back and forth ideas for this, and, and you know, Ed has some amazing new stuff that he's bringing to this webcast, and I'm bringing some new stuff too uh, to this webcast as well. But there's things that we've really honestly felt couldn't be left out that we needed to address if we wanted to have this particular webcast be complete. And we're going to talk about some core fundamentals 
for pillaging the village, some core fundamentals for post-exploitation in order to be an effective security tester. Whether you're an internal network pen tester or an external network pen tester, these things are, without a doubt, key. We're going to talk a little bit about password spraying. Talk about group policy preference files and shares, lots of data on shares. I really just can't say enough of just how important dealing with shares and files and folders that are accessible to you post-exploitation actually is. And I want to throw a special thanks out to Bo Bullock from Black Hills Information Security. He's at Daft Hacked on Twitter. Uh, if you guys get a chance, you should absolutely go out and follow him. It'll freak him out a little bit. He did a presentation that was very similar to these first three, four slides uh, at uh, B-Sides Tampa. And uh, we have some screenshots that we have that we sanitized from Black Hills Information Security to kind of show you the impact of what happens when this is done correctly for these core things. So whenever I teach 504, Ed, um, we get to the SMB section, right? And, and Ed knows the section very, very well. It's actually the first section I ever taught to Ed Scotus. Uh, way back when I was getting started teaching for the SANS Institute. And, and it takes a little while for some of the students to understand the overall impact of what can happen with net commands, what can happen simply with a command line on a Windows computer system, and just how quickly you can escalate from a standard user to something like a domain administrator or a standard user to another user that's on the system. And as I said, it's all about curiosity. I'll give you a, a t kind of a backstory. When we hired a, a pen tester about a year and a half ago at, at Black Hills Information Security, he was in this funk about trying to find an exploit. And, and Ed has this slide at the beginning of 560. Um, and he's teaching, I think, in Orlando coming up here in a little bit. And 560 is the SANS network penetration testing class. And it's like within the first 15 to 20 slides, and it talks about exploits. And a new pen tester that went to work for Ed years ago, and that pen tester said, man, I've got to find an exploit. I've got to find an exploit. And Ed told that pen tester, it's OK. Exploits are not the stuff that gets you in. It's passwords. It's getting access to different systems. And knowing that and teaching 560, I then did the same thing with my tester. I let him kind of languish around for about a day, trying to find exploits. And then we sat down and we ran these three commands. And within about half an hour, 45 minutes, we had domain admin in the environment. So what do these commands do? Well, the first thing is, once I get on a system, I do net view by itself. There's no real special uh, you know, command associated with not trying to see the shares on my system or a remote system, just running NetView. And NetView by itself will give a list of all of the systems that are on the local network with me. Now the reason why that's important is it gives me a view of the topology and the systems that are important nearby. And people tend to name their systems with very, very descriptive names. And it gives us a very, very nice, clean tar set of targets to go to once we have some level of credentials. Next thing we like to run is net user space forward slash domain. The reason why we do that is because we want to dump all of the users in the domain. Pretty straightforward. For me, when I'm testing, I like getting user accounts almost more than getting passwords. And, and the reason for that is with the right password spraying technique, you can gain access to these accounts with nothing but a command line. And that command is right here. Um, Ed's going to take the, the command line kung fu in this webcast up to 11 here in about just three or four slides. But a really basic for loop, right? We go 4F in. We're going to have a users file. You're going to take the users that you got from net user space forward slash domain, and you're going to put them in that users.txt file. Then you're going to start another loop, and you're going to loop through pass.txt. Now, pass.txt would be one or two, maybe three passwords that you want to try in an organization, like change me one, two, three, company one, two, three, uh, variations of passwords and a date. But you want to come up with some passwords that most people are going to use, or most organizations are going to have somebody that uses that password. Then you iterate through that list of users big list of users, really tiny list of passwords, and you see how many users are using one or two of those passwords. Now, we call this grinding, usually. When we haven't gotten domain admin through standard you know, exploitation and pivot methods and finding files, you can do this. And if it takes you three days, sometimes it does, you have to wait in between each of the successive tries, because this is going to generate a failed login attempt for those accounts and those passwords. So you want to make sure that you don't make the list of passwords too big because you're going
trying to lock accounts out if it crosses that failed login account threshold. Okay, so you're going to set that up. You're going to run it against an organization. Now we have a couple of uh, we have a couple of things that I, I would like to bring up. Uh, uh, Jeffrey brought up some really great points. He said. Think of what a default password may be for a new user. Like change me one two three is one of those things that just is always coming up all the time. Um, and and you know mentioning using it on running it on like a Thursday or a Friday or a weekend at night. But you want to be careful with it because you still might lock out some accounts in the process. And when it runs, it looks like this. Uh, we've gone through and redacted quite a bit of this slide, but you can see that we've got the same loop that we had on the previous slide. And you can see all of these lines that you see with a star. Every single one of those are accounts, colon, and then the password that, we, that worked. And you can see the vast majority of the passwords are password one, or it's the name of the company, then one, two, three. Uh, this is a fairly large organization, and that means we now have access to all of those accounts. And in this particular test, I can't remember for sure, but I believe at least one of these accounts was an overprivileged user. Not a full domain administrator, but for the intents and purposes of a goal-oriented pen test, it was enough access for us to achieve our specific goals. And we're going to talk more about that a little bit later. Group policy preference files. Now, group policy preference files is one of those gifts that's going to just keep on giving for a long, long time. Now, some people that are in this webcast are going to say, wait a minute, I applied that patch, so therefore I don't have to worry about group policy preference files ever again. And that's not true. You see, the, the, the problem was whenever you created automated scripts to like create accounts and passwords on workstations, it would create this group policy preference file, like groups.xml file and sysfall share. And in that would have an, an kind of, an, I don't want to say a hashed representation of the password, let's just say a poorly hashed representation of the password. And you can see down there, it says user description, demo, user account, and password equals. Now, that password equals file, that key for actually extracting the clear text is actually public. So that means that anybody could go through and extract the clear text password associated with that particular account. And further, tools like Metasploit and Powersploit have the ability to automatically decrypt those passwords almost instantly and give you the password, the clear text password. Many times that password would be a local administrator account for the system that's automatically being created, or sometimes you find out they're using that same password for domain administrative level accounts. Um, so this particular way of getting domain administrators is one of the quickest headshots you can possibly pull off. Now back to the patch. You may have installed the patch, or an organization may have installed the patch, but it didn't necessarily fix the problem. See, it fixed the problem of putting the password in that file, but if somebody had already ran these scripts, have already got these XML files with these passwords in it, they're going to persist on the system. So as I said, this is definitely going to be one of those gifts that keeps on giving for pen testers for a very long time. But my favorite out of all of these post-exploitation techniques is shares. Uh, if you've been on a number of webcasts with me in the past, you know I get really excited about indexable directories on web servers, where I can just go through and look at all of the HTML files, all the PHP files, all the ASP.NET files that exist on these various servers, and just look at things like source code, look at things like configuration files, and try to find things like user IDs and passwords. And by and large, in most organizations, it works to get remote access, just looking at information or low warnings from a web server perspective. But that whole entire idea is amplified by a factor of 100 once you get access to a workstation. See, once you get access to a workstation, as a standard named user on the domain, you have access to a tremendous amount of information in the form of shares. So this is where I oftentimes tell pen testers, you need to stop worrying about domain administrator. You gotta have fun. It's all about the love and it's all about the learning. And really, when you start going through this, it's, it's almost this weird voyeuristic rush, right? You're going through this organization's dirty laundry, you're going through this organization's sensitive data, and, and you're just pulling up all kinds of crazy files, like this file has all kinds of user IDs and passwords for a whole bunch of systems. Uh, we're gonna talk a little bit later about pivoting and getting access to bastion hosts and jump hosts, but one pen test that we just finished uh, a little two weeks ago, uh, they, they said, hey, we want you to get access to our SCADA network, and sure enough, they found an Excel spreadsheet with all of their jump hosts, all of their user IDs, all of their passwords to gain access to the SCADA network. Now, if you were just running Nessus, running Metasploit, running Core Impact, running Immunity, you would completely miss all of this. You would miss out on the, on the wonderful things 
about doing a network penetration test. And what's cool is if you don't get domain admin, sometimes it's completely irrelevant. Uh, one organization that we did not get domain admin on, we were able to get access to their supplier portal and we could ship anything we wanted from the company anywhere we wanted in the company. We had their full shipper account and information and we could basically pull anything from that company and basically have it dropped anywhere. Another company we got access to their financial system. Uh, another company we got access to their credit check system for their employees and background check system. So there's all kinds of wonderful things out there. You just got to go through it and you got to spend some time parsing through the data. But lucky for us, a lot of these files have things like password in the title. SQL uh, backups are awesome as well. So it is very, very cool. So that's how you can basically sit down and kind of peruse the network and you can kind of look at what you can access. But now let's shift gears a little bit. Let's say you want to get really creative. Let's say you want to do things like SNF. Let's say you want to do things like pivot through computer systems to get access to sensitive network components. And for that, I'm going to pass it over to Grandmaster Ed Scotus. Thank you, Mr. Strand. I appreciate it. Very cool stuff. So um, for this section of the webcast, I want to introduce you to some really powerful capabilities that are built into Windows. One of these is the NetSH command. Oh, and let me just give you a little comment on the slides here. Um, John Strand and I have been working together for well over 10 years, and I have this um, old shoebox full of old photos of, of Strand and me. I mean, you know, we're good friends and such, so I put some of those photos, I scanned them into my computer, and I put them on these slides. So here is one picture of me and John Strand. You can see us there. I think it's pretty obvious who's who. Uh, this is awesome. Picture. This was actually my this was my first selfie actually. This was this yeah, was a good right. time, Ed. Yep, yep, yep. So that's that's a selfie that John took of him and me. And in the subsequent slides you'll see other pictures, and it's always John and me, and you can kind of figure out which one of us is which. So um but the focus I'd like to take here is on the NetSH command. And you say, Ed, I know the NetSH command. It's you know built into Windows and I can use it to like change my IP address or to configure the DNS uh, server or, or stuff like that. And you certainly can, but I want to show you some little known features of NetSH that are completely awesome when it comes to post exploitation. Now when you're using NetSH you can use it all in one shot. Here I'm launching it at uh, PowerShell, you see PS, C colon backslash greater than. You can also run this at cmd.exe. NetSH is nice in that it's agnostic. You can run it from PowerShell or you can run it from a regular cmd.exe shell. And what I could do is this, NetSH interface IPv4 show addresses, and that'll show me the IP addresses for all of my interfaces that are configured for IPv4. Or I could do NetSH interface IPv6 show TCP stats. This is kind of cool. It'll show you the number of TCP packets that you've sent. Um, and that's, that's just very nifty. You could do NetSH interface IPv6 show ICMP stats. That will show you how many ICMP messages you've sent and how many you've received. And for each one of these NetSH interface show commands, you could follow it with an RR equals and then give it an integer. That's a refresh rate. And it will rerun that every n seconds and just display the output on the screen. So for those of you that are familiar with like netstat dash NAO space one, and netstat will rerun itself every one second, you can do the same thing within NetSH. A lot of people don't realize that. And it gives you a nifty little way to kind of monitor what's happening on your system. No, it's not an outright sniffer, we'll get to that a little bit later, but it will show you these fantastic stats. So that's using NetSH all in one shot. Another possibility is you can use NetSH as kind of a local little shell. So here I'm at the PowerShell prompt at the bottom of the screen, C colon backslash greater than, um, NetSH, just hit enter right after that, and it puts you into a NetSH prompt. Then at the NetSH prompt, I can start changing into different contexts, and I can go into the context of interface, hit enter. I can then go into IPv4, hit enter. If you ever hit a question mark, it will show you all of the different options you have at that particular space. Um, I could do also show space question mark, and that will show me all the different kinds of things I can show. The purpose of this slide is to give you an overview of NetSH. You can run it all in one shot, as I show you in the middle of the slide, or you can run it in sort of an interactive prompt mode. Now, some of you are sitting there saying, thanks, Ed, so what? Give me something new, something that maybe I didn't know about before. That's coming up. Let's go to the next slide, please. And you'll get to see the next picture of John Strand and me. Um, all right, so remember those good old Netcat relays on Linux where you could like forward one port across the network? I'm doing that at the top of the screen here. I'm making a backpipe using the makenod command. So makenod, I'm going to call it backpipe p 
P means I want to create a named pipe in the file system so I can dump data into it and pull data out. It's going to be useful in creating a port pivot relay. And then on Linux, I can do a netcat, listen, that's dash L, dash P on local port, give it some port number like 11111. I'm going to attach that netcat listener standard input, that's zero less than, to my named pipe, backpipe. So I've got this netcat listener that's just kind of waiting. If there's any data in backpipe, it's going to shoot it back out across the network once it gets a connection. Whatever comes into it, though, I'm going to pipe, that's the forward pipe there, into netcat to some R host machine on some other port, 2222, as you see here. Whatever comes back, I dump into backpipe. This is a traditional netcat relay. Many of you are probably familiar with that, and that's wonderful. Now, wouldn't it be cool? I mean, you guys know that netcat's not built into Windows, and you could push a netcat up into Windows, but gosh, if I want to do a port relay, so I listen on one TCP port, whatever data arrives, I push to another machine on another TCP port, wouldn't it be cool if I didn't have to push netcat onto a target machine to do that? I mean, Linux has netcat usually built in. And you could use it this way if Netcat's built into your Linux box. But what about a Windows machine? I want this capability native in Windows. Can I do that? Wouldn't it be cool if Windows could? It turns out it can do that. On Windows 7 and later, our buddy, the NetSH command, can do it. Watch this. Here I am at my prompt. I do NetSH interface. I'm sorry, I'm in the interface context. Port proxy, because this will cause it to listen on one port. Whatever data arrives, it'll shoot out on another port. Add, so I'm going to add a port proxy here. V4 to V4, so it's, I'm going to be IPv4, going to IPv4. I give it a listen port where to listen. Listen address 0.0.0.0. .0 that means listen on all of the interfaces. Connect port is the port I want to connect to on the other machine. And connect address and give it the R host. Hit enter. Dude, you're like rocking. You're, you, you've got to pivot now through that machine. And the coolest part about this is see where it says V4 to V4? You could change that to V4 to V6 or V6 to V6 or V6 to V4. That's awesome, because at the TCP layer, TCP doesn't even notice that you're shuffling around between IPv4 and IPv6. So you could hack a single box, run this NetSH interface port proxy command on it, and you could then pivot IPv4 into that machine and shoot out the other side on IPv6. How cool is that? From a pivoting perspective, that's beautiful. Now, here's the deal. When you do these things in a pen test, it gets very easy to forget that you left these little port pivots on the target box. You need to delete them when you're done. Instead of using add, you could do delete in the command to remove it. But don't forget to delete these when you're done. All right. So port pivots. That's kind of cool. But you want something else. I can tell. Let's go to the next slide. Please. Thank you. All right. Now, you know, Linux is very nice because it's got all these remote capabilities like SSH and such so I can connect to the machine. And, um, you know, that's, that's very neat. I can, I can get sort of a remote shell in the box. Now you could do that with, with Windows with something like PSExec, but you know PSExec's not built in. You've got to download that from, from Microsoft. Wouldn't it be cool if we had the NetSH capabilities that I've been talking about so far, but if they had remote capabilities kind of built into it? Wouldn't that be neat? I mean, it wouldn't be like a full shell. It's just sort of like a shell-like thing. I mean, NetSH stands for net shell. I want all of NetSH's capabilities, and I want them across the network without PSExec. See, sometimes you're on a pen test where you're not allowed to use outside tools. You have to live off the land, and they might not even let you use something like PSExec. So it turns out, check this out, NetSH allows for remote capabilities. It's got it built in. It's kind of like a shell, not a general purpose shell. It's a shell for network administration, but it's built into Windows itself. You don't need PSExec. Now, you will need admin credentials. You'll need SMB access. You'd have needed those for PSExec anyway. But you don't need PSExec to do this. No separate download required. So check this out. You're the pen tester on the left-hand side of the screen, right? Red hat, black, or, or red screen, black hat. On the right-hand side of the screen, we've got our target machine. Both of these are Windows boxes. I, as the pen tester on the left-hand side, can run at my prompt NetSH. Hit Enter. Then I can say set machine target IP address. And notice how it changes the prompt context. It'll say target IP address NetSH greater than. When you do that set machine target IP address, it makes an SMB connection pa passing through your current user's credentials, which means it's subject to pass the hash, giving you remote NetSH on the target box. And then you can do interface port proxy add, V4 to V4, V4 to V6, whatever you want, all the stuff that we talked about before, plus everything else that NetSH can do. How cool is that? So NetSH remote across SMB living off the land. But Ed, you say, 
Uh, port proxies, that's useful. NetSH remote's useful. How do I configure this NetSH remote thing? Maybe you tried it on your own box, doesn't work. Let me show you how to configure it. Next slide, please. Oh, you see that picture of John and me there? Yeah. John is very big. Oh, there's another picture yeah. of John and me. Covered with oh, oh, that was that was awesome. That was Orlando in 2012. I remember I it well. Yeah, yeah, the, <laughs> yeah, stay the candles are still standing. Well <laughs> done, sir. So how do you get remote NetSH access? If it's not already set, you have to configure the target's filter policy to allow your access. There's a, there's a, a registry key called uh, local account token filter policy. Um, you have to set that to a value of one or else you can't PS exec, so it makes sense you can't even net SH remotely with that. Now the target organization may have already done that for you because they use PS exec, so sweet, that step might have already been taken care of. If not, that's what you got to do to make it take effect. You do reg add backslash backslash give the target IP address software, Microsoft, Windows, you can see it up here. So that configures the box for remote access via PSExec or NetSH remoting. Next, you've got to start the remote registry service and remote access service. These may already be running as well because they're using it to remotely administer the box. But if they're not, this is what you do. You do SC, that's the service controller command, backslash backslash target IP address, and you say start remote registry and start remote access. This will pass through your current user's authentication credentials as long as you're in the admin group and you have SMB access, it'll start up those particular services. Then you can use NetSH to remote in. You could do it like I showed you on the previous slide with NetSH, enter, set machine, target IP address, and then other stuff. Or if you want to do it all in one command, you do NetSH-R. Don't you love how Windows has all these different inconsistencies in its commands? It's not NetSH backslash backslash whatever. That's what it would be for the SC command. But with NetSH, it's NetSH-R for remote machine. I think they just have different groups at Microsoft, each of which runs these different, writes these different pieces of code. Um, anyway, that's why I wanted to have very detailed commands on these slides so you can get the slide deck, and it tells you step by step. Step one, two, three, make sure you've got this done, and you're ready to do NetSH remote. But Ed, I want more, you say. I, you know, I can get on the box. I can do a port proxy. What else you got for me? I got one more thing. Let's go to the next slide, please. You get to see another picture of John Strand and me. There we are. Okay. I don't. I don't, I don't wear glasses anymore. Just. Yeah. Just so I do. I and do. But you have a beard. I do, in ah, fact, have a beard. But I have a beard good. only because you have a beard, sir. See, I'm following in your footsteps. Um, well, I'm, I'm wearing like a, red tights right now. Just so you. Uh, anyway. Um, uh, so, isn't it great that when you when you're doing a pen test and you get into a Linux box? there's a pretty good chance it's got TCP dump already on it. I mean, not always. Sometimes you get into like an embedded Linux on some sort of like little tiny footprint device. But if you get into like a Linux server, there's a pretty good chance it's got TCP dump on it. So you can start sniffing and you're, you're, you're like a boss, right? I mean, you're there, you're sniffing packets. That is just fantastic. Sadly, Windows doesn't have WinDump built into it. But wouldn't it be cool if it did? Would it be really, okay, WinDump, maybe, maybe WinDump we don't want. What, we, we just want some sniffer built into Windows. Turns out there is, my friends, a sniffer built into Windows. Oh, yes. It's via the NetSH command. If you're on Windows 7 or later, you can run NetSH trace to create a packet capture. And I will show you how in just a bit. The packet capture, look, this is from Microsoft, so it's going to be in Netmon format. Um, so if you want to use a tool that, it focuses on PCAP format, you're going to have to convert your Netmon packets into PCAP. Um, Josh Wright wrote a little tool that focuses on wireless packets, but can convert wireless Netmon packets into libpcap. He released that uh, a few years ago via InGuardians. It's called NM2LP, Netmon2LP. So you, the pen tester sitting on the left-hand side, can hack that target Windows box and say, dude, start sniffing for me. And you don't have to install a sniffer. It's already there. See, if you were to install like WinDump with WinPCAP, you're probably going to have to reboot the box to load the driver. Oh my gosh, what a mess. You just want to sniff, right? So NetSH Trace is your buddy. Now when you turn on the capture, it's going to capture it in a format called ETL. ETL. That can be imported into Netmon. Let's go to the next slide and show them how to do this, John. Another picture of John Strand and me coming up. There we go. I'm not sure which is John and which is me, but I, you get the idea. It was a... It was a crazy day. Uh, we, it, was, it was, yes. <laughs> so, so here's how you start it. At your prompt, whether it be a C colon backslash prompt or PS, uh, PS C colon backslash prompt, you do NetSH trace start. Okay, I'm going to start a trace. Capture equals yes. 
If you don't do the capture equals yes, it's actually going to be tracing events that it will give you in a cab file. And that's all it will do. It won't get packets. Capture equals yes means I want some packets, dude. Overwrite equals no. What it will do is it will create the packets in what you specify as your trace file. But if your trace file already exists, by default it overwrites it. So you do overwrite equals no, meaning I don't want you to overwrite any previous packet captures that I've got here. So you do netsh trace, start capture equals yes, overwrite equals no, trace file equals, and then you give it the file path to your ETL file. And it's actually going to create two files for you. A cab file, which will have events in it, and an ETL file, which will have the packets in it. So you let that run for a little bit. Oh, and when you're done, you do netsh trace stop. Please don't forget to do that. Because if you keep the trace going, it'll grab packets, but only up to a maximum of 250 megabytes. It stops automatically after that. I guess Microsoft was a little concerned that something might crash if you sniff for too long. Anyway, you do that, it'll create the ETL file, it'll create the CAB file. You can then bring those back to your own machine, and you can open up the ETL file, which will have your packets in it. You can do it in Microsoft Netmon, which is available for free from Microsoft, or Microsoft Message Analyzer. That's their newer tool that they're trying to position to replace Netmon. Um, dude, you just did a, a packet capture on a Windows machine using built-in software, and then you open it up back on your own machine. If you want to sniff more than 250 megabytes, you have to add to the netsh trace command I showed you earlier, max size equals, and then give it an integer. This thing also supports some fairly complex filtering. So you can filter just from certain source IP addresses or destination IP addresses or what have you. And the filter syntax, of course, is completely different from BPF filters because Microsoft does everything its own way. Um, so rather than going through a tutorial on how you create filters for this, I show you how you can display the filters right on your screen. You do netsh trace show capture file help. And that will show you uh, the ways you can create different filters to specify in your netsh trace command. Sweet. All right, well, we've got a bunch of ideas here. Let's kind of put them all together with one final picture of John Strand and me. John, can you move to the next slide, please? If we go to the next slide, okay, there we go. Oh, yes, I was so happy when John gave up smoking. Uh, you can see me smiling in the background because he's about to give up smoking. Um, so that's, that's very nice. Um, I, was, I was a little bit grumpy that day. <laughs> yes. In all honesty, to, you were too. I had some work done on my teeth since then. But I wanted to give you a scenario that shows you all of the techniques I just described in one scenario. So you, the pen tester, in step one, you can figure, so you've, you've hacked target one, and you've got admin access and SMB access. So you, on your pen test Windows box, configure your machine to get remote NetSH of target one. So target one is ready for your remote SS, NetSH into it. Then you do a NetSH interface add port proxy. So you're going to do a port proxy creation on target one. Once you've created that port proxy, you can then pivot through that machine using various protocols to get access to target two. So in step three, you're going to relay through target one to get access to target two. Then on target two, you're going to run NetSH trace. Capture equals yes, so you can start sniffing on target two. And then step five, you're going to bring those packet captures back, open up in Netmon. Certain versions of Windows software will allow you to uh, you know, export that, and you can look at it in more detail. So this is just showing you step by step each of the techniques that I've covered here. And, and the beauty of what we're talking about here is we're taking ideas that we take for, for granted in, in Linux, right? I mean, each section I just went through, I said, you know, we do this in Linux, and isn't it wonderful? Linux is so great. And then I said, wouldn't it be cool if we could do this with Windows built in? And with this cool little NetSH command, using these different techniques, you can, which is just wonderful. I love Windows. Hacking Windows is just such a joy. Ah. So I'd like to turn it back over to Mr. Strand. John, you want to pick it up yep. on the next slide? Absolutely. So you know, we talk about pivoting. Why is it key? And in, in one of the things that, you know, we're doing webcasts like this and we're bouncing ideas back and forth. Like there's one thing in there that just absolutely floored me and blew my mind was the idea that we don't have to do like a named pipe in Windows. We can actually do it with NetSH and that's cool, right? And when we're looking at pen testing, you start collecting all of these little tiny things like the cool net NetSH commands that you can set up pivots. There's cool net use commands to find, you know, different shares, different 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 accounts and the domain. And, and what happens as a pen tester is you have all of these little tools and you start using them, right, in, in, in your penetration test. And, and this kind of gets to the crux of why the NetSH commands, why being able to start a sniffer, why trying to set up pivots and relays is so critical. If you look at what's happening now in the industry, we had a webcast last week and we were talking about PCI 3.0. 
and how PCI 3.0 requires us to actually test and validate segmentation. It isn't just a matter of saying, this is the PCI zone. These are the four systems, and Mr. Pentester and Mrs. Pentester, the only thing we want you to do is attack those four systems. We now, as pen testers, have to validate the segmentation. And we're starting to see more and more segmentations in organizations that are healthcare organizations. They're starting to segment off sensitive equipment like kidney dialysis or radiology. We're seeing PCI environments using segmentation. You're seeing HIPAA environments, once again, trying to break things down, and DOD environments have always used some level of segmentation. So if we look at our current tool sets that exist for network penetration testing, they, they don't get us all the way there. They, they don't. Whenever we're trying to pivot and gain access to these, these internal segments, it, it just doesn't. Now, we have Metasploit and the Metropiter and the Route command where we can route our traffic through a compromised computer system to gain access to another computer system, and that's great. But lately, um, we've noticed in a couple of penetration tests that the customers explicitly asked us not to use these tools. In a lot of ways, organizations are doing that to try to hamper the pen test, reduce the overall effectiveness of it. And some of them, they're genuinely concerned about a penetration tester bringing in some malware into their environment, and then it spreads wild, and it takes over the entire environment. So they say, oh, you can't bring in anything unless it's your tool. You can't bring in anything than what you have. And as a pen tester, you've got to be willing, and you've got to be able to handle that. Right? So with that segmentation, you're going to run into situations where you have to pivot through internal systems. And you're going to have to set up port relays, and you're going to have to set up sniffing. And that type of large-scale, enterprise-wide capture the flag is really why Ed Scotus and I do what we do. And that's why we continue to do what we do. And that's why we have people that work for us at Counterhack Challenges and at Black Hills Information Security that love doing this stuff, because those are the problems that we constantly have to work through. So that type of pivoting is important. That type of testing of segmentation is important, but there's a whole nether side of segmentation that is also important. See, we can set up pivots to pivot around the inside of an environment. We can also set up pivots for what leaves the environment, the egress filtering, actually testing the egress filtering of an organization. So we're starting to see, in addition to segmentation, internet whitelisting, VLAN segmentation as far as restricting what can go out to the internet, and even in some situations, some quote-unquote air-gapped networks where there's absolutely no way the sensitive network is connected to anything um, to the outside world, and we have to be ready to handle those types of situations as well. So on the topic of leaving, as more organizations are getting better at doing analysis of egress filtering, of what is leaving their environment, we have to up our game as well. Because using a standard Metasploit, reverse TCP, or reverse HTTP uh, uh, payload may not be as effective in the next couple of years as it was in the previous couple of years. Because we're seeing organizations that are doing quote unquote, deep packet inspection, and they're looking for command and control, and they're intercepting HTTPS. They're trying to intercept that encryption that's leaving the environment. And we need to be able to find ways to get those environments to communicate out of the organization and still get our implants or, 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 or malware to work for us, right? So some protocols are still allowed out, and they're not analyzed really all that well. Uh, Ron Bose's DNS can is an absolute champ for this, right? Having all of your command and control go over well-formed DNS traffic pivoting through their DNS servers out to your system and back, beautiful, beautiful. Those are the types of things that we desperately need to start looking into as penetration testers. And the reason why is because we need to mimic the bad guy. We need to be able to mimic what bad guys do. This is one of those things that, you know, I, I, I have this an enviable position, it says, that I straddle the world between the forensic side of the house, the pen test side of the house, and the security side of the house. So I have, you know, geniuses like Eric Cole talking about security best practices. I've got, I've got people like, you know, Rob Lee talking about forensics and what they're seeing. And then I've got grandmasters like Ed who's coming up with all of these really wicked ways of pivoting around the inside of an environment just using the command line. And I have to work on trying to put, bake all that into 504 and making it work. And we got to start talking about defenses for these things. And right now, our defenses for handling a lot of the more advanced backdoors really don't work all that well. We expect to buy a product. We expect to buy a Palo Alto. We expect to buy a Fortinet device. We expect to buy something from Cisco, and it's going to work in all situations. And it can't, and it won't. And we'll talk about why. So if we're looking at it, for finding ways out, DNS works great. DNS cat is perfect for that. But a massive amount of organizations are also allowing their users to go to Gmail. 
on a regular basis, right? And some organizations are using Gmail or Office 360 for document editing and document collaboration. We're moving more and more to the cloud. So is it possible for us to use that as a command and control method? Well, it turns out it is, right? It absolutely is, okay? Anytime we can have any bi-directional communication, it means that, that is a possible avenue for a backdoor in an, an environment. And we've seen some malware that does this, like back B K D R D S C L O C A, um, or Murdoch, which uses Google Spreadsheets, which is an awesome upgradable framework for using Google Docs and Spreadsheets for command and control. But we wanted to focus on using Gmail. We wanted to focus on using the email portion of it. And this is something that was put together in a fit of development by uh, Benjamin Donnelly last week. Um, just absolutely awesome stuff from Ben. He's the guy that did Ball and Chain at DerbyCon. He's a contributor to the book on active defense and offensive countermeasures and a huge contributor to active defense, the active defense harbinger distribution, he rocks. So created this very, very simple backdoor and as a proof of concept to show how we could do command and control through email, specifically using Google itself. So let's walk through this. Now if we want to get started, the first thing that we have to do is actually set up a, a Google Mail account. Now, I know that that seems like it's absolutely a given, right? I understand that. But I'm going to warn you, please don't use your personal Gmail account for this as part of your network penetration test. Um, the reason why you would want to use a disposable account is the user ID and password for logging into the Gmail account is actually going to be embedded within the script itself. So it can communicate effectively, log into Google, and send and receive email all through the power of using Python. So please do not use your personal email. Um, that would be one of those things that if I was a defender and I got the pen tester's user ID and password for logging into their private Gmail account, I'd laugh at you and you'd probably deserve it. So the script configuration, the, the actual Python script itself is extremely basic. Um, I think it's not even two pages. If you printed the thing out, it's extremely small, extremely tight code from Ben. You go through and you establish the configurations where you can put in the username. And you can see that we have Baines, John, and friends at gmail.com. And then, of course, you have to put in the password. You have to enable these things. By the way, as part of attending this webcast, you're going to get access to the slides. You're going to get access to the script, the Python script. And you're going to get step-by-step -step instructions on how to set it up in your organization so you have a backdoor using Gmail um, and, and your pen test moving forward. So it's a very simple script to edit. And then when you have to log into your Gmail account, and you have to allow less secure apps to connect in. Now, there's some funky things with authentication and IMAP that Python and its libraries really just don't support all that well right now. So you have to basically turn on access for less secure apps. Don't worry. It's not like it's sending it across the network unencrypted or anything. It just basically has to do with the authentication protocols on the Gmail side of it. Now, here's a friendly diagram on how this actually looks. You can have the attacker. The attacker is communicating into the Gmail account, is authenticating into Gmail, and it's just checking email and it can send email. Now, the client on the other side, or the, 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 the implant or the malware on the other side, can be on a target network. Now, if you notice in the slide, I have eight systems, right, and they're all connecting up to Google. That's because, once again, a lot of organizations have multiple users that are all using Gmail very regularly. It's interesting to me because if you went back to 2003, 2004, 2005, there's this huge push to shut down personal emails. You, know, you can't use personal email while at work. You have to use your work email and everything else is locked out. And um, that all stopped. And the reason why it stopped, by and large, is executives got frustrated. They're like, well, I want to access my Gmail account or my Yahoo account or my Hotmail account. And you, you can't have a policy that's just for everybody other than executives. So it kind of got opened up for everyone. And HR thought it made the workplace nice and wonderful. So everybody on the target network is using Gmail. They're all logging into Gmail. They're logged into their work email. But we have one very sick, sad computer. It's the one that has the sick sticker on its face. That system is compromised. It is also surfing out to Gmail, and it's communicating, except in its situation, it is using it as a backdoor. So what does it look like? That's pretty easy, actually. Um, if you try to run GCAT by itself, you just run Python GCAT, and it says proper usage is like this. Am I running as an implant plant or a client? The implant is what you put on the remote computer system that you're trying to take over. That would be the server. That would be the malware. That would be the payload. The client would be controlling that malware, that payload, that implant on that computer system. And then you have to give it an ID. Um, now, it's weird because when people look at this, the first thing they think is, is that a port? No, no, no. It's a client ID. 
And the reason why you have a client ID is if you infect and take over multiple computer systems, you want to make sure that they have unique client IDs. And the reason why is they're all going to be logging into Google, they're going to be going through the emails, and they're only going to execute things with their specific ID associated with them. So you can have multiple systems all using the exact same Gmail account as well, but they have to use a separate client ID. Then you can run commands on the little scripts. You can basically connect in run the who am I command and then you'll get the results back and of course you can see it running on the other side as well so it's just basically taking any commands that it receives it's dropping it down to the operating system command line and then the operating system command line gives you the results and then it basically forwards the results back to the client now it does all of this through email so you're going to see lots and lots of emails queuing up as the command and control is, and as the command and control and the data that's being sent back and forth is being shuffled between the client and the implant itself it's very very cool so so, so it, oh, go me, ahead. your 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 shell history is in is in your email right I mean, it is <laughs> absolutely and and let's be honest as a pen tester that's pretty awesome, right? I mean, that's yeah. like logging in Metasploit. So you can actually log the commands that were sent. So if somebody destroys your implant, you still have proof that you had access to that computer system. Um, now, it, as we said, the script is extremely small. This is a proof of concept. And the reason why we want people to start doing this is, you know, once again, Ed, we talk to a lot of security firms, right? You do a lot of pen tests. We do a lot of pen tests. And one of the big things that we consistently hear from the organizations that we test is, you know, restraints, right? Restraints on budget. Restraints mainly on manpower. It's quickly becoming obvious that good security organizations are not organizations with specific technologies, but they're organizations that have the right people manning those technologies. Um, people that are, you know, watching NetFlow data, and they're saying, you know, this particular system is communicating out to Gmail at 2 o'clock in the morning, and it's still sending a lot of data back and forth. We might want to investigate that. You need to have the right people. And as pen testers, professional penetration testers, we need to show risks to our organizations that we do testing. Um, a number of years ago, sharing a little bit of history between Ed and I, um, Ed said, I am only interested in the defenses of an organization for the purposes of trying to bypass those defenses. And for years I was hurt and I was, I was offended by this and I took up smoking. And you know, it, the reason why it's so important for us as penetration testers to have that mindset is we are the architects of modern IT. We are. We're the ones that understand the failure points. We're the ones that understand exactly how you can have one failure point be mitigated by another particular control because we deal with it on a regular basis. And as penetration testers, we need to take tools like GCAT. We need to use it in our network penetration tests so that we can demonstrate the risks to organizations. And hopefully, we can start seeing vendors come up with better tools uh, to detect these things. One of the things I, I forgot to talk about in my slides is I've been playing around with, uh, this, with this GCAT tool. And I found out something very interesting. A lot of products that do interception of SSL, a lot of products that are looking, doing the deep packet inspection thing that they always talk about, are completely ignoring traffic going back and forth to Gmail. Um, the reason why is they look at Google, they look at Gmail, they look at it as a trusted site. There's clearly no command and control that's going to be going through there, so they ignore it. That's how they can get the performance pass through that they need is because they're ignoring large chunks of data from certain organizations that are quote unquote trusted, like Google. That's a security risk. As a pen tester, we need to share that information with our clients and hopefully try to make things better because we know those failure points. We show people the failure points and we work with people to develop better uh, solutions, better components, better composites, better materials for their IT architecture. Um, I want to close out here with a couple of quick things. Um, you know, we, 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 so, so Ed and I spend a lot of time talking about what makes pen testers from good to great, what makes people that teach at SANS from good to great, and it boils down to a very, very simple thing every single time. It's about the love. It isn't about the tools. It isn't about wearing, you know, getting shells. It isn't about being a hacker. It isn't about getting domain admin. It isn't about, you know, the way that we look or that we're part of a specific group. It's about having a certain level of obsessive compulsive disorder, curiosity, the ability to keep digging. 
and constantly trying to share that with the organizations that we do work with and our friends to try to make things better. And you know, we we <laughs> and it is probably one of the only people I know that does more webcasts um, that, than I do because we do a lot of them. And the whole goal of everything that we do, once we find something cool, you know, Ed's one of the first people. He finds something cool, and he's in the lunchroom with the instructors. He's doing webcasts. He's doing evening talks, and he's sharing what he found. He's sharing what his team found uh, immediately, trying to make things better. And that's what we need across the board. If you find yourself ever trying to hoard cool techniques and not share it with anybody, you're probably not all that cool of a person, and I wouldn't want to hang out and drink with you or have a good time with you. We're all friends, and we need to be sharing all of the vulnerabilities, all the different things we have all the time. I, um, I also think about go ahead it yeah. in the context you know steel sharpens steel and you know as a pen test community we we are trying i mean all of us working together to improve the state of infosec in our organizations and you can't lose sight of that you really need to have passion you need to share techniques and and really try the or, try to make the organization um, improve its security stance that's really what the bottom line is so yeah. go ahead john Sorry. I want to close with one final thing. Um, so Ed is teaching 560 in Orlando coming up in April. Um, and, and if you're interested, if you like what you saw here and you're like, wow, I would really like to have six days of that, um, then I cannot recommend a class like 560 more. Uh, it, it's just a fantastic course. Um, all the people at Black Hills Information Security either have the 560 cert or are going to be getting it very, very shortly. And uh, there's, no, there's no better instructor in the world uh, than Ed Scotus. So if you guys have an opportunity, you're looking for a class and you want to go a little bit deeper in some pen testing techniques, um, <laughs> you can take 560, uh, preferably in Orlando, Florida. So Ed, let's go through some uh, questions that we have here. Yeah, we got a bunch of uh, questions. I, I'm I'm really excited about this uh, Orlando session. I mean, it's a beautiful place to be. Winter here is proving to be very wintry. <laughs> I am looking forward to going down Orlando, April 13th through 18th, teaching my heart out in 560. Uh, somebody asked a question. Actually, one of the questions we got from Idris says, "Is this the kind of stuff that you cover in 560?" That's what she asked. Does this information get covered in 560? Absolutely. This and a whole bunch more, because the goal of the class is to have you be able to do end-to-end -end pen tests. That's that's what 560 is all about. Now, John, can you go one more slide forward, too? Yep. If you would mind. We there also we have go. other events that Sands asked us to tell you about. We've got at Security West. That's going to be in May, um, and these are the pen test courses that are in that. It'll be in San Diego. So we've got 504. John Strand is going to teach that. He's fantastic. Don't tell him I said it, though. <laughs> really, really good. I mean, just amazing. We got web app pen testing. We got network pen testing. We got all kinds of great stuff there. Josh Wright is going to be teaching 561, which is a bunch of hands-on stuff, 80% hands-on class. And then we're doing this thing we call Pen Test Austin. That's also in May. Um, and for that one, we're going to do some extra net wars. So you're going to get three nights of net wars. We're going to do one night of Cyber City missions. And we're also going to do a thing called Coin of Palooza, so you can earn SANS pen test challenge coins for classes that you've already taken, but maybe you didn't win the coin. So the Orlando thing's coming up in April. I'm so excited about it. And then we've got these coming up in May. We've got San Diego, and we've got Austin, Texas. Um, I hope you'll check them out. Now, let, let's move over to the questions. I got some really cool questions here. Um, I'll just go ahead and start answering some questions. John, if you want to prepare to answer yours, maybe I'll do a couple of yeah, them. Yeah, absolutely. Go for it. Yep. So got a great question from Jeremy. And in fact, actually, a couple people asked the same question. But Jeremy, I think, was the first one to ask it. Hello, Ed. You mentioned be careful to delete the NetSH port proxy when done. Just curious, does port proxy survive reboot like NetSH DNS alteration would? Yeah, it does, which is kind of cool, right? I mean, if the machine reboots, your port proxy is still there. But you could see how, if you do a pen test and aren't careful to clean up, you could leave these things behind. And somebody could pivot through it. And maybe, you know, if that machine were dual homed, if it was on two different networks, you could introduce a security risk with them. So you've got to be careful with that. These things do survive a reboot. Um, yeah, and that's one of our greatest fears, isn't it? Something yeah. we do leading one of our customers getting compromised. So please be careful. Amen, brother. Uh, Phil asks, uh, can we get these slides? Yeah, the slides will be included uh, in your portal account. They're also recording it, so you can listen to this again. Eduardo says, do these commands, referring to the NSH commands, do they all stick if the NIC is disconnected? Yes, they do. Once the NIC connects again, they're reapplied. These things are persistent buggers, which is scary and cool. Um, also, does this work on 
Wireless to bridge networks, yes, it does. So you can specify an IP address for it to connect to. I did 0.0.0.0, .0 so that it'll connect to any interface. But if you specify a given IP address that is assigned only to one interface, it'll just connect to that one specific interface, which is pretty powerful. Um, Joel asks, is the NetSH remote shell a type 2 or type 3 login? It is a type 3 login, a remote login across the network. Um, so, so there you have it. So there's some questions that were asked of me. John, you want to take some that were asked of you? Absolutely. Uh, so one of the questions that people asked is, are, are these slides and is this tool going to be made available for everybody? Absolutely. Um, when we are done here, I will share out a Dropbox link to the, to the SANS Network Operations Center gods, and everybody that is registered will get a link that will have a link to the slides, and it will also have a link to the tool and the usage sheet as well. So, Jeff, you will be getting that as well. So another question from Phil. Could this GCAT get through a click-through warning banner on a forwarding proxy? Um, on this particular situation, it depends on the protocol. Right now, it's actually using IMAP. It is not using like the full HTTPS. But you know what? It's easy to do. It's a proof of concept tool to show that this is, in fact, possible, absolutely possible for it to switch over to HTTPS. And as we continue to build this tool out, we will add in that HTTPS, HTTP capability as well. So as soon as you have authenticated with your browser, through that particular proxy, uh, that authenticated warning banner proxy, it's going to ride out on top of that exact same level of authentication as well. Oh, apparently oh, there is a new, a version. new version of Mac GPG2 GPG is available, oh, and I must install it now. Evil oh. grade. Hey guys, uh, what what's the evil grade command again? To no, uh, no, 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 no. We're not going to do the evil grade John, thing. John, while well, you clean the back door out of your system, um, oh. I'll ask her a couple more questions. Sam, Sam asked if you could go back to the previous slide um, about the Orlando thing. I don't know if he wants the URL or something like that. Um, so a couple questions here. Kevin says, I just tried some of the NetSH commands. It requires admin access, right? Yes, it does. It requires an, uh, admin access. That's, yeah, that's, that's the breaks with that one. But, you know, PS exec would as well. And you're doing powerful stuff. It's probably good that it requires admin access. <laughs> uh, I'd have to say that's a great thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Andrew asks, what was the name of the new MS NetMom? It's called Microsoft Message Analyzer. You should check it out. Honestly, when I look at Message Analyzer, that's their new tool, they released it about a year ago, and it's the successor to Netmon. When I look at Netmon and I look at Message Analyzer, I think it was written by someone who looked at Wireshark and said, that's really cool, I want to make something like that. But the person who wrote it, or the team that wrote it, had no idea what, what made Wireshark so good. Because it's a mess. Oh my gosh, it's a complicated mess. But the fact is, it's useful. Um, and useful is good. I, I like that yeah. a lot. And we oftentimes awesome. compare things back. You remember the old network general sniffers? Um, you always compare it back to those things. It's like, oh. well, it's better than those, so it must be okay. Right, right. So th those were some good questions I got from people. Um, somebody says, can you share the slides? Um, well, they're distributed through, through the SANS portal account, and also you know, you'll be able to hear the streaming uh, audio of this thing. I might post these slides on the SANS pen, SANS pen test blog as well. I think oh, do we want to put this video up there? That might be. This might be a good video to load on the Sands pen test blog. Yeah, yeah we, we'll make sure that you, you get them in different ways, and we do want you to share these with people so that um, so that they can benefit. And really, I mean, you can see John's stuff and the stuff I did. We wanted to give you like command by command by command. You know, um, Mubix has a wonderful thing he put together maybe a year and a half or two years ago on post exploitation. It's a Google Doc that he lets everybody get access to. And it's post-exploitation for like everything. He's got advice yeah. for Windows, for Linux, for BSD, for this, for that. And it's just command by command thing. It's M-U-B-I-X, Mubix, Rob Fuller. Um, and one of the things I wanted to make sure is everything we just covered for you was not included in his stuff. Not because I don't like his stuff, but I wanted to do something in addition to that. Because I take what Mubix has given away for free in his post-exploitation Google Docs as kind of the baseline of really deep and really solid post-exploitation. So we should give him some credit for that. And then to say that you know, everything we just covered here is not in there yet. Um, uh, it's probably in there now. <laughs> it's probably in there now. I, I wouldn't be surprised if Rob was here. And he's like, he's adding them as we speak. Yeah, that's cool, yeah. man. That's totally cool. But, I love that. And, and that, you know, and, you know what, that gets to a good point. There's a lot of people that ask how they can help 
get started in computer security and if specifically network pen testing. I mean, I know you get asked this every SANS conference. I get asked it all the time. My answer is go out and make your own scene. Start sharing things, even if it's basic NMAP stuff. It's little videos on using Linux stuff. Uh, but doing things like creating post-exploitation sheets and sharing them out or contributing to those is really the stuff. Because when we're looking to hire somebody, if they've done that, if they've actually been somebody that's been out in the community and done something really cool, those are the people that we want to hire. So get out there and share. And that's one of the things we love about Rob. Everything he learns, he's constantly sharing. He's always yeah. running out and he's sharing it on his blog. He's sharing it in that spreadsheet. Um, he, he, he's, he's fantastic. Yeah. Well, I, got a, I think we still have a couple more minutes. I, I got another uh, question here. One, it says, NetSH Trace doesn't seem to be installed on my machine, just try it at work. I have some machines where NetSH Trace doesn't exist. I have other machines where it does exist. Um, I haven't been able to figure out exactly why it's not on some of my machines, because they're the same version of Windows, exactly the same. Um, I've got it on every Windows 7 box I've got. On my Windows 8 boxes, I've got it. On half of my Windows 8.1 boxes, I've got it. On the other half, I do not. Now, I do have something for you, though. If you don't have NetSH Trace, Microsoft Message Analyzer has the ability to connect across the network and to do a remote trace that way. So you can download the new Microsoft Message Analyzer for free. If you don't have NetSH Trace on your target, you can configure on your Windows box Microsoft Message Analyzer to connect using SMB and uh, admin credentials to a target machine and do a remote packet capture on the target machine. You're not using NetSH Trace, but you are getting packets and you're not installing any software on the target. It's it, so that's a nice alternative um, if you have a Windows box that doesn't have NetSH Trace. So there you go. Um, very cool. And I think we're out of time. Um, so there was a lot of questions, by the way, that people shot. And they were like, hey, what the, this? And can we get the tool? Can I get the link? And here's our email addresses. And if you guys have any questions, please, please, please. Uh, shoot us an email. We're always happy to answer those questions. And one of those questions should not be, will this be made available publicly? It will. We're going to make the video available somehow, uh, either through the portal or on the website. And you're also getting the slides and you're getting all the tools. So just sit tight. You'll be receiving those emails uh, probably within the next 48 hours or so, uh, by think, Monday at least. I think Trevor was going to have something to say to kind of close the whole thing out. Trevor, did you want to jump in there? Trevor, do you want to take us out? Yeah, sure, no problem. Thank you. Uh, I would like to say thank you so much to our featured speakers, Ed and John, for their great presentation and for bringing this content to the SANS community. Uh, to our audience, we greatly appreciate you listening in today. For a schedule of all upcoming and archived webcasts, visit sans.org forward slash webcast. Until next time, take care, and we hope to have you back again for the next SANS webcast.